What's going on guys, my name is Matt, and today I have a video that should be both pretty entertaining and helpful. What I have for you today is a full PC build guide. The price point is $600. I'm going to be going over each of the parts and why I picked them. I'm then going to show you how to put this system together. And finally, I'm not only going to be doing gaming benchmarks, but I'm also going to be showing you guys how this performs while streaming. This will probably be a pretty long video, so I'll try and provide some timestamps in the description so you can navigate through the video with ease. Before I get any further, I want to say that this video is in partnership with Micro Center. I went off of prices you can get on Amazon or Newegg, but if you have a Micro Center near you, I would highly recommend shopping in store for some of your parts, as doing so would make this PC actually cost less than $600 due to combo deals and other discounts. Just to reiterate, this is a $600 gaming PC that you should be able to go out on Amazon or Newegg and find these or comparable parts for the prices listed in this video. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the parts that make up this $600 gaming beast. So the CPU is generally the first thing I pick out for a system, as other than the GPU, this has the biggest impact on gaming performance. What I went with is probably the best price to performance CPU out right now, which is the Ryzen 5 2600. This is a 6 core, 12 thread, overclockable CPU coming in at only $120. This guy's great for gaming, and the fact it's a hexacore processor with multi-threading, it means it can be used for other tasks like streaming and even some video editing. This is a generation old and is on the Zen Plus architecture, but the value for money it's providing is unparalleled. Being that this is only $10 or $15 more than the Ryzen 5 1600, to me, it was worth the extra money to go with the 2600. Moving on to the CPU cooler, this is another area where the 2600 provides great value. Included with our CPU comes the Wraith Stealth Cooler. This is a relatively basic cooler, but it has pre-applied thermal paste and gets the job done. Moving on to the motherboard, I tried to pick an affordable board that had a good feature set. What I went with is the Gigabyte B450 RSM. This is a pretty good value for the money at $80. It has an adequate VRM setup, 4 DIMM slots, and a good number of PCIe slots for expansion. This board does only come with one M.2 slot, but it does have a heatsink and one is probably enough for most users. The back panel I.O. is pretty good with two USB 2 ports and a PS2 port for per peripherals, a DVI and HDMI port, 6 USB 3.1 ports, 4 being Gen 1 and 2 being Gen 2, and it also has a gigabit ethernet and your standard audio ports. One other thing I like about this board is the fact it has a pretty neutral color scheme and I like the looks of it a lot. Moving on to the RAM, this is a place where I wanted to focus a good amount of attention to. Ryzen really benefits from fast RAM and cheaping out in this area could cause a substantial loss in performance. With that being said, I still had to be very budget minded. What I got was the 16GB kit of XPG RAM on sale for $55, but you should be able to find a comparable kit for around $60. This is 3000MHz CL16 RAM, which is a pretty good sweet spot for price to performance RAM meant to be used for a budget Ryzen system. 16GB is more than enough for any game you throw out the system, and 16GB should be enough for streaming and even 1080p video editing. This kit worked perfectly with the system at its rated speed and matched well with this neutral black color scheme. Because we're only using two of the four available RAM slots, it means upgrading to 16GB of RAM in the future is as simple as clicking in two more 8GB sticks, which takes all of one minute to do. Moving on to storage, this is an area where you could go a number of different ways. For me, I decide to use all the storage budget on this 500GB SU800 SSD for $50 on sale. You may not be able to find this exact drive at $50, but you should be able to find a number of $50 500GB SSDs at any given time. The Patriot SU800 is my go-to price to performance drive because it has DRAM and performs well. You could use this budget in a number of ways, with another being to get a 240GB SSD and a 500GB hard drive. 500GB gigabytes in my opinion is plenty to start with and upgrading is very simple. 500 gigabytes gives you enough room for your OS, applications, and a good number of games. Next, let's go ahead and talk about the graphics card that the system's using. I knew I needed to get a graphics card that was under $200, and around that price point, there's only one really new option worth considering. What I went with is the PowerColor Red Dragon AMD RX 590 8GB. This comes in at $180, which is a great price for the performance you're getting. 8GB of video memory is plenty for any current game and will be enough 
enough VRAM for the foreseeable future. In terms of performance, this is a great 1080p card and even holds up well in 1440p. While there are rumored to be new AMD cards coming out within the next few months, for now, this is what I would go with at this price point. Next, let's go ahead and talk about the power supply in the case, which were both provided by Corsair, so thanks to them. Starting off with the case, this is their new 110R. It comes in at $70 and is an ATX mid-tower with tempered glass side panel. Now yes, our motherboard is micro ATX, but it still looks fine in this system. This is a pretty good case for $70. You get a tempered glass side panel, power supply basement, rubber grommets, and multiple dust filters. It does only come with one fan, which I would like to have seen two at this price point. Even still, this one fan works fine as exhaust and none of the components thermal throttled. I like the look of this case, but question the inclusion of a five and a quarter inch bay. It kind of disrupts the minimalistic design language on the front, but I do understand there are still some people using optical drives and other five and a quarter inch expansion units. The side panel's tinted, so it's hard to see inside with the components we have for this build, but adding a set of LED fans later down the line would be a good idea and would brighten things up a lot. Finally, let's talk about the power supply. The RX 590 is a relatively power hungry card and I wanted to make sure I got a unit with at least 500 watts. Power supply prices aren't great right now, but for $50, you can get an 80 plus rated Corsair VS550. This is a non-modular unit, which is fine because all the extra cables are hidden under the power supply shroud. The only real downside is the ketchup and mustard cables, which obviously don't affect performance, but are pretty common in this price range. Altogether, for $600, you're getting a bunch of parts that make up a great gaming PC that also can be used for stuff like streaming and video editing. Now that you've seen all the parts and heard the rationale behind each, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to put the system together in a step-by-step -step guide. I know you guys like this for the last build, so I decided to do it for this build also. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble the system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you'll really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a pair of pliers. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver, this will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next, let's go ahead and talk about static. I personally don't worry about it and have never had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. I like to start with opening the case as I want this ready to go as soon as I'm ready to drop the board into place. Just take the case out of the box, remove the foam and plastic coverings, and place these pieces back into the box. Now we're going to remove both of the side panels. The tempered glass panel uses four pegs with thumb screws. Just unscrew each holding onto the panel as you have the case standing up, and once the screws are out, just lift the panel away. If you're worried about dropping the panel, you can always do this with the PC on its side. Next, we're going to take off the back panel. This is held on by two thumb screws. Just unscrew these one at a time. They're captive, so they stay attached to the side panel. Next, pull the panel towards the back of the case to free it from the chassis. Make sure to put all of these side panel screws in a safe place. I like to place the side panels back into the box for safekeeping. I especially like to do this with side panel windows because this prevents the chance of kicking it or it falling over and scratching or breaking. With that done, you're left with an open case mostly ready to build in. Now we're going to get everything installed in the motherboard. Go ahead and get your motherboard box out, open it up and pull out the motherboard itself, the manual, the SATA cables, and the IO shield. Next, take the motherboard out of the bag and gently set it onto your table. Put the bag back in the box, close it up, and set the motherboard onto the box. This acts as a static-free workspace for the motherboard, and more importantly to me, the sharp solder points on the back of the board won't be able to scratch my table. Next, set the accessories to the side and pull out your CPU box. Open it up and take out the CPU itself enclosed in the plastic clamshell. Pull out the cooler box, open it up, and remove the top plastic so it's ready to go. Before you take the CPU out of the plastic, bring your attention to the CPU socket. Push down and out on the metal retention arm so it's freed from the clip, then lift it up so it's perpendicular to the board. Grab your CPU, only handling it from its edges, and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Another way to know it's lined up is to make sure the Ryzen logo is parallel with and closest to the thick top part of the socket. Next, just lower it into place applying no pressure. 
You can give it a little wiggle to make sure it's seated properly, then just push the retention arm back down and make sure it clips into place. Now to get ready to install our cooler, we need to remove these two plastic pieces. These are for installing the more beefy Wraith coolers and we don't use them for the Wraith Stealth. To remove these, you just unscrew the four screws, two on each, and lift the piece away, but leave the back plate in place as we will be using that. Next, grab your cooler out of the box. If you flip it over, you can see there's pre-applied thermal paste, which works fine and is what we'll be using for this build. Take the cooler and start to lower it into place, lining up the screws with the holes in the back plate and making sure the Ryzen logo is facing towards the back I.O. Once in place, go ahead and tighten all four screws going in a cross pattern to ensure there's even pressure across the CPU. Next, locate the CPU fan header which should be to the top right of the cooler. This header has a notch in it and so does the CPU fan connector. Line up these two and press the connector into place. You can now tuck away the fan cable if you want to make things look a little bit neater. Now we're going to install our RAM. Take the RAM out of the box and out of the plastic. Next, take your attention to the RAM slots in the motherboard. Open up the second and third slot from the core. You do this by pushing open the clips on top and bottom of each slot. Next, take your RAM sticks one at a time, align the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot, and lower it into place. Once you're sure it's in, press it down in the slot until you hear a click and both clips close. Repeat the same process for the other stick of RAM. Once this is done, we can finish getting the case ready for the motherboard to go in. Set the board to the side and grab the case again. Pull the bottom hard drive sled out and pull out the brown box inside it. Slide the caddy back into place. Inside this box are all of the screws necessary to install each of the components. Now lay the case on its side with the main compartment facing up. Grab the IO shield we took out of the motherboard box and line it up so the RS logo is out and facing up. Align it with the back I.O. cutout and press each corner into place. Next, pull these front panel cables to the back of the case and return the case to its side. Remove the two standoffs that look like this that are closest to the PSU shroud. You can use a multi-tool like me, or even pliers if they're too tight to hand unscrew. Put one of them here and one of them here. They don't need to be super tight, but they also shouldn't be loose. Now we're going to be installing our motherboard in the case, so move any cables that might be in the way. Lower the board in, aligning the I.O. on the board with the I.O. shield. Make sure you can see the standoffs through the holes in the motherboard. Next, grab out the eight motherboard screws that look like this. You can double check you're using the right screws by looking at the case manual which will clearly state which screws are which. Screw these one at a time into each of the holes in the motherboard. Next, locate the fan header that says Sys Fan, located towards the top left of the motherboard. Take the back fan cable and plug it into the header the same way you plugged in the CPU fan cable by aligning the two notches up and pressing it into place. You can now set the case to the side and pull out the power supply box. Take the PSU out and untie the cables but keep the twist tie handy. Pull aside the 24 pin cable that looks like this, the 8 pin CPU cable that looks like this, the PCIe cable that looks like this, and the SATA power cable that looks like this. You can now bundle up these last two cables and twist tie them back together to keep them neat and out of the way. Next, orient the power supply fan facing down, slide the unit into the case, then push it towards the back. Align the four holes in the power supply with the holes in the case. Take the four screws included with the unit and screw each one into place to secure the power supply. Next, take the big 24 pin connector and push it through the rubber grommet here, and take the 8 pin CPU cable and push it through the top hole here. Now's a good time to push the PCIe cable through this grommeted hole in the power supply shroud. Now take the front panel HD audio cable and route it to the bottom hole towards the back of the case. Now route the USB 3 cable and the front panel connectors through the rubber grommet here. We can now put the case on its side and start plugging things in. Take the 24 pin which is the biggest one and make sure this little breakaway piece is pushed together to make one big connector. Then align the notch in both the cable and the header and plug it in. This is hard to see so I also demonstrated this on a motherboard outside of the case to give you guys a better look. Next take the 8 pin CPU cable and plug it in with both notches lined up. Again this is hard to see so here's another angle of an 8 pin CPU cable being plugged in. Something I forgot to do at this step but you should do now is take one of the SATA cables that looks like this and plug it into one of the motherboard SATA connectors, then route the other end of the cable through the nearest hole to the back of the case. Now we'll connect the three front panel cables. Find the header towards the bottom left of the board that says HD audio, and find the block connector that also says HD audio. Align the layout of the pins on the header and the connector, then press the cable into place. Next grab the cable that says USB 3 and locate the USB 3 header on the motherboard. Align the notch in the connector 
connector with the notch in the header and press it into place. Once this is done, the front panel connectors are next. Referring to the manual install each connector onto the specified pin. This is probably the most annoying part of the build and I really wish these front panel connectors came in a block that you just pressed in all at once. Now we'll go ahead and install our SSD. Flip the case back onto its feet and unscrew the SSD caddy towards the back of the case. I grabbed the front one but realized when cable managing the back one would be better. Take the SSD caddy and align the holes in it with the holes in the SSD and screw four SSD screws into place that look like this. Now plug in the SATA power cable we left aside earlier and the SATA data cable we routed towards the back of the case earlier. Once done, you can put the caddy back into place and remember to use the spot to the right of the one that I'm using. The last thing to install is our GPU. Unscrew the top two PCIe covers and set them aside, but keep the screws handy. Next, open the PCIe slot lock for the top slot. Now take your GPU with the IO facing the back of the case and align the notch in the GPU connector with the notch in the PCIe slot. Once aligned, just press the card into place. Now replace the two screws you had just removed to secure the card into place. The final connector is the PCIe cable we routed earlier. Take this and attach it to the GPU power header the same way you connected the 8-pin CPU cable. I used the second connector on the cable so I could make the end product look a little neater. Now before we close the system up, we need to neaten up the cables a little bit. This is totally optional but highly recommended. This case comes with a dozen or so zip ties. Pull each of the cables so there's as little cable as possible in the main chamber, then zip tie the cables to keep them in place and make them looking neat. Once you're satisfied with your cable management, reinstall the back panel by sliding it into place and re-screwing the two thumb screws. Next, to reinstall the tempered glass side panel, I like to lay the case on its side. Put the glass into place, then screw each thumb screw in one at a time. Next comes the best part of the entire build, which is peeling off the plastic from the window. With that out of the way, the build is complete. One tip I'll give you is to put all the component boxes inside of the case box. This allows you to keep them in case you need to make a return or RMA apart in the future, and it keeps all the boxes relatively compact and in one place. Once built, you need to install Windows 10. I use free, unactivated Windows, which I have a full video about, and the only downside is a little watermark. Other than that, it performs the same as fully activated copy of Windows. I'll leave a link to a few tutorials on how to do this in the description down below. Below. So now that you have learned about the parts and how to build it, it's now time for the benchmarks. I tested 5 different games ranging in difficulty and even tested streaming a few games which I know is something many of you are interested in. Let's go ahead and start with either everyone's favorite or least favorite game, Fortnite. I tested Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings which is epic view distance and everything else set to low. At these settings the system produced an average of 203 FPS and 1% lows of 185. This was a great experience and shows for a game like Fortnite this is about as powerful as a system as you could need. Next up is Borderlands 3. This is a super new, popular, and graphically demanding game. I set things to medium settings at 1080p and used the built-in benchmark. These settings allowed for an 81fps average and 1% lows of 67. Next up is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, another difficult to run game. I used the built-in benchmark at 1080p high settings and the system received an average of 77 with 1% lows of 55. The final two games I tested are more esports titles. The first is Rainbow Six Siege and at 1080p high settings with the built-in benchmark, the system received a 192fps average with 1% lows of 154. Finally, I tested CSGO because a lot of you requested to see it benchmarked. At 1080p competitive settings, the system received a 235 FPS average with 1% lows of 196. Now, after I benchmarked these games, I decided to test streaming. To be honest, I know very little about streaming, so take these results with a grain of salt. I used OBS Studio and used the recommended settings and streamed at 30 FPS. I think the bitrate might have been 6,000 kilobytes per second and at 1080p. I first tested Fortnite with these same competitive settings and locked the frame rate at 120 FPS, which I've heard locking the frame rate can improve streaming quality and consistency. The game stayed at a locked 120 FPS and the stream seemed to look and perform perfectly fine. Next, I decided to try and stream a more demanding game with that being Borderlands 3. I again played at 1080p medium settings and capped the frame rate to 60 FPS. The game stayed at a lock 60 FPS the vast majority of the time and the stream again seemed perfectly fine. Overall, the system performs great and for $600 you're getting some good value for the money. Obviously at this price point there are a bunch of different ways you could use the budget so let me know what you would have went with in the comments 
section down below. Again, thanks to Micro Center and Corsair for providing some of the parts used in this build. With all this being said, I think it's time to wrap this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up, as well as consider subscribing for more PC and tech-related content in the future. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.